Today, I want to tell you about storytelling. And the storytelling is essentially the mechanism that governs our communication. And storytelling is one of the most ancient and efficient forms you can use to communicate your brand, no matter of the industry. And I want to tell you the story uh, that will uh, basically boost this understanding. And well, right as if it's a webinar about the storytelling, I will start by telling you a story, a story that might thrill anyone dealing with finances, marketing, sales, and branding around here. And I'm going to tell you the story that happened in 2009, when two young gentlemen, Rob Walker and Joshua Glenn, wanted to verify whether the uh, objects value or the things can get more value if you add a special element to them uh, in a form of a story. They later on published the results of their experiment on a website called Significant Objects. And you can also always um, go to this website to delve into the details of this, um, of this experiment. But I will tell you that those two gentlemen, Rob Walker and Joshua Glenn, basically wanted to answer the questions, do stories really sell? And to answer that question, they acquired, bought, or just got uh, approximately 200 objects uh, for the collective price of $250. Uh, the objects included you know, petty little things, um, uh, figures, minifigures, and other things that they bought or acquired from people who basically wanted to get rid of that stuff. So for $250, they bought 200 items, and you don't have to be a clever genius math to configure that it actually cost $1.25 per item. Okay, so no wonder those items were really cheap as they included things like this rather redundant old SARS mask that was donated. Actually, people donated it, so it cost approximately one zero dollars to get this mask. Uh, the other objects were interestingly in, in almost like in interior decorations like this pink horse. Uh, this one was not donated. It was bought online and it was bought for a staggering price of $1.00. 40. And then there was a tiny little minifigure, you know, how tiny, there's a little penny there. Uh, so the tiny minifigure of the Indian maiden, uh, also purchased online for the price of 99 cents, so less than a dollar. So they bought 200 items just like those, and they uh, collected them, they cataloged them, they added some product descriptions, and then later on, they sold them online. And this time, for those 200 items that were, remember, previously bought for $250, they got $8,000. So compared to the previous price of $250, that's an increase of 2,750%, right? I think if you are dealing with the finances, you would be very much very much happy, thrilled, and excited if the uh, if your if your margin was like this. So, what exactly did they do to achieve this type of the thing? Uh, the, so, they achieved this thing by adding by adding uh, a story to each and every item. So, each and every item in their collection got a single uh, new story that explained the meaning of the story uh, of the of the object that in, uh, included the history of the very object so the story was like this it in included the object uh, the the object itself and also it included the other uh, the other elements of the story. Uh, what this story actually proves is that there is a magnificent power over the that there is a magnificent power over the uh, over the in the line of the story uh, in the line of the story and this can be all those proofs can be found on the significantobjects.com. I told you this story to prove to you that stories do actually sell. And I wanted to tell you that they also allow you to increase the margin. 
So every time you sell your furniture or whatever other interior, des uh, interior uh, design uh, element or piece, you might increase its value by adding a significant story to it. In other forms, stories form sort of a relation that you cannot achieve otherwise. And the case of Artifacts, a furniture, furniture company, proves very well. Uh, here you have the furniture that is rather a high-end furniture sold for quite a lot of money. And it was um, this furniture company was established by Dan and Sarah Meth in the United States. What they did is they told the story of the company that was created out of the need of looking for something that is really significant. And they also share all the details and elements of the design process, as well as they show and capture the stories of the production design, uh, giving also the insight of what are the stories behind people who create the furniture. And they also make sure that each and every step of the production is properly documented. They give you the up close of the material, which include things like uh, oak and other rather expensive solid wood. But what they also do is they give you an insight into the story of how they care about sustainability because they tell you the story of how they own a farm uh, where they can actually uh, where, where they actually plant the, 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 the trees themselves uh, to have a more sustainable approach. And those stories strike well with the customers that can be well defined now as belief driven consumers, because across um, Europe and and both Americas, we have a rise uh, of a target group that is um, considered belief-driven consumers. Who are belief-driven consumers? Those are, those are consumers who not only look at the price and the functionality of the product, but they also look at the set of values that the brand communicates and acts upon. And in this case, the value is sustainability, minimalism, and minimal lifestyle. And they tell the story rather well, so that later on, they can actually not only prove the margin, but they can get a higher price on their product. And that higher price is justified, just like in the experiment done by, by the two guys I told you about. Another prime example of such a furniture company that does it well is called Floyd. And what they did is, once again, in a form of a very short story, uh, they, they, um, they create a, uh, a note on their website, which says this, okay, we began because we were tired of disposable furniture. So we set out of design products of lasting quality for how people live today. Furniture should be made to, for home, not for the landfill, made with materials that last. It's a different way of making furniture. We call it furniture for keeping. So of course, this is not a rocket science whatsoever, but here you have a story of a group of people that were sick and tired of disposable furniture, okay? They are not naming culprits here, but I think they mean Ikea, for example. So what they did is just like any other hero, they set out to a journey to design products that have lasting quality because they care and they want uh, others to see that they care. So <clears throat> these are the two examples of how brands use storytelling or storytelling hints to uh, engage the consumers and build a lasting impression that they do care and that they can build sustainable relationships and sustainable businesses. So what stories actually do, they do sell. And they do that by increasing the value. The increase of the value means that you can have higher marg margins and that you can have a better uh, uh, referral uh, and, um, and returning customers. So, uh, so because also not only do stories increase value, but they also do boost retention. And by boosting retention, I mean they make people remember so not only they remember the brand, but they also have positive associations with the brand throughout the storytelling. They, the stories, they also build your brand in which your brand is either a hero who sets out on a journey to solve problems 
or a brand is a, um, is a companion who helps your customer to deal with their challenges and the stuff in their life. Stories also are one of the best way to communicate what you do. But of course, here you have to focus on the stories about your customers and not only stories about your brand, okay? One way to do the social media storytelling is actually by not using too much of the information about you, but by adding uh, a lot more stories, success stories or challenge stories or any other type of the stories, but from your consumers, how they use your product, what is it that they love about it, how it, in, how it is integrated in their life. And also what stories do, they unite your tribe, just like Apple united its tribe of people who actually recognize each other by not only the Apple logo, but also even by the color of the messaging in the messaging app. Have you even noticed that if you're if you have an iPhone and you're talking on the uh, on the um, via uh, text uh, with somebody who also has an iPhone, you identify the other fellow tribe by seeing the blue uh, chat bubbles, whereas others have green chat bubbles. Why is that? Because Apple makes sure that if you are an Apple fan, an Apple tribe. Uh, then, of course, uh, you have to uh, identify other members of the same tribe. So there you have it. If you use storytelling, not only you increase the value, you also make people rememberable. You build a sustainable brand that has a relationship with your customers and you have a vast array of communication messages available, but you also make your tribe stick and become more loyal. And now let's talk about this boosting retention thing because maybe you are, well, reluctant and you think, okay, why would I use storytelling to help people remember more about my brand? Maybe it's just better to have some data and statistics. Okay. Well, to prove that point, I will tell you yet another story. This time, however, it was slightly earlier than 2009. Actually, it was um, 50 years earlier. It was in 1969 or well, 14 uh, years, 40 years uh, earlier. And in 1969, two American scientists, Bauer and Clark, decided they want to chain, check whether or not they, the stories sell, but whether the stories boost retention, namely whether the uh, narrative stories are mediators for serial learning. They, they later on published this in an article titled Narrative Stories. Well, of course, where you have a high emphasis on narrative stories. As in any experiment, they had a lot of, rather large group of participants that they then randomly assigned to two groups. And in those two groups, the assignment that the task that the members of those two groups had was rather similar. It was to remember as many words as possible from the list. The list was a random list of English words. It was random uh, to, uh, to avoid any kind of methodological mistakes in the study. And the words were as follows, lumberjack, dart, skate, hedge, colony, ducks, uh, furniture, stocking, pillow, and mistress. And in the first groups, the, the, the people, the participants were told, okay, you've got the list, use the list, learn the words from the list, and later on we will see how much you remembered. Okay, it was the equivalent of you giving your, uh, your uh, clients a list of facts about your company. And then uh, on the other hand, the second group was given the same list, but then they were told that they have to write the story using all the words from the list. And well, in the first group, nothing interesting happened, but in the second group, uh, this happened. They came up with stories like this that apparently uh, has all the words in it. And it's a story about the lumberjack that darted out of the forest, skated around a hatch past a colony of ducks. He tripped all some furniture, tearing his stockings while hastening toward a pillow where his dress, mistress lay. It's a good story. I mean, it's kind of almost like a you can Netflix prime feature, you know, uh, about a, a fabulous lumberjack who was, you know, so eager to go to his mistress. But, you know, what is even more fascinating than the story itself is the result of the studies. Because Three minutes after the task, there were no differences between two groups. So in two groups, people could remember quite a lot of words and without any problem. But <clears throat> what happened after two weeks is really interesting because after two weeks, there was a difference. People who were using just the list were actually uh, could recall, could remember, remember 
13% of words. And those who were using the story, well, they could remember a staggering 93% more. That says it all. Not only your stories that you will tell your customers increase the value and help you justify a higher margin, but they also help customers remember more details about you and have this relatable uh, affection towards you. So what I did is I, you know, I was so fascinated by this, uh, by this study by, by Bower and Clark that I decided to replicate the experiment. And in replicating this experiment, I, of course, you know, had some sort of a, a different approach. Um, um, I decided, okay, I'm going to once again have two groups, but I'm not going to compare, of course, the uh, the list of words because that would be too easy. Why would I replicate it that way? I actually decided to replicate it in a slightly different conditions. And in this experiment of mine, uh, I've decided to have, again, a large group of participants. This time it was 100 managers from one of the companies I've worked with. And I have divided those two groups, uh, to those the group into two groups I randomly assigned participants and in both groups I intended to teach participants about feedback okay and you know um, and the rules that I wanted to teach them were you can't um, uh, you can't feedback um, uh, you can only feedback person on work action or behavior uh, you can only um, uh, you can only have um, uh, uh, active, uh, active, active consent. So somebody has to say, okay, I'm okay with you giving me feedback. Uh, you have to have the feedback delivered personally. Uh, you should never do it publicly. And especially if the person is not present. So in one group, I uh, gave the people those, um, those facts about uh, feedback in a form of the list. Okay. And <clears throat> in the second group, I gave them uh, this in the form of the story only to check whether after two weeks there will be differences in you know remembering the rules of the feedback okay so the first group was given the list and the other group was given the story and the hero or rather heroine of the story was katie melua okay you might not well you probably remember her but even if you don't remember her as for name you probably remember her song when she quoted how many uh, bicycles are there in beijing but in her song there is actually a more astronomical per se number where she sings about uh, how many a billion light years uh, are there from the edge well probably universe she's thinking of here uh, and uh, let's hear how she sings and that's one actual verse All right, well, uh, remember that I was telling them the story. And uh, uh, in this story, Katie Malua actually sang the song. And uh, well, if she sang the song and there's the verse, then of course it is subject of feedback. It can be feedback, okay? Because you can actually uh, feedback somebody on their work. And this time it's a beautiful poetry, so you can have feedback on it. And actually someone decided to give uh, Katie Malua feedback on her work. And that was Simon Sai the author of the Big Bang Theory, which is, um, which is actually, who is actually a famous astrophysicist, a very good scientific uh, researcher. And what bothered him was not only that Katie Malua did a bit of an error there, because it's not 12 billion years, but it's actually 13.7 billion light years from the edge. But what bothered him the most was that Katie Malua uh, mentioned that it's just a guess and that nobody knows that it's true. Whereas he and other astrophysicists make everything with a, uh, uh, within uh, their possibilities to scientifically prove that this is a fact, okay? So, um, well, of course he had the right to give Katie Malua feedback, but he made a couple of mistakes. Well, first of all, he did not ask Katie Malua whether she wanted feedback. He uh, did not get her consent for that. The second is that he decided uh, to do the feedback, uh, not personally, but publicly in a newspaper uh, and, uh, and doing it without her being present there. So he committed the three worst crimes of the feedback, which would probably mean that it was not feedback after all. And 
Apparently, he wrote a, uh, a um, article in The Guardian called Katie Milua and Bad Science, where he accused her of making uh, all the possible mistakes <clears throat> in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, uh, science. And Katie Milua apparently not only sings and writes poetry, but also reads The Guardian. So one day she was just sitting there with a nice, keep, uh, with a nice uh, uh, cup of uh, warm tea, and she saw feedback right at her. And she got very sorry because she did not expect that. Uh, and uh, she later on called Simon Sign. Apparently, if you're Katie Melua, you are allowed to get uh, everyone's phone number. So she called Simon Sai and she said, uh, Simon, I'm really sorry. I should have known better. In school, I was actually in the astrophysics club. So I should have known better the facts. And I'm really sorry. And I hope that you will accept not only my apology, but also the new version of the song that I wrote for you which goes this way now. We are 13.7 billion miles from the edge of the observable universe. That's a good estimate with well-defined error And with the available information, I predict that I will always be with you. There you have it, a very clever answer. So next time someone gives you feedback that is not really a good feedback because it contains three major mistakes being publicly done without a consent and without the person feedback present, either don't say anything or be like Katie. Okay, so that's the story. And uh, remember, it was an experiment. I wanted to see what will be the differences in retention of the material between the two groups of people. One that was given the list, and the other that was given the story. Again, three minutes after, there was no significant difference between those two groups. But what happened after two weeks really astounded me because there was a difference. Once again, people who were using the list, they could recall well, approximately 21% of the facts from the list, so one fifth. The ones who are using the story, well, they could remember much more, and that much more was 72%. So once again, there you have it. Not only do stories, uh, the, the stories increase the value of your product, the value of your company, they increase the value of your brand, but they also help the customers remember more about your brand. So if you're trying to make them remember important information, do not hesitate, use storytelling. So why does it exactly happen? Well, when you give people information in the form of a list, the only two areas in the, in the brain that light up is the Broca area and the Wernicke area, which are responsible for speech recognition and speech formation. That's fine because that means that people are probably understanding the words you uh, write to them or you tell them. But that is not enough for people to engage emotionally. To have people engage emotionally on an emotional level, and that is all about marketing, then of course you need something more. And what that what happens when you use stories. Because when you use stories, you, the, the brain lights up just like a Christmas uh, tree, you know? So <clears throat> this Christmas tree means that you uh, here have the brain that has um, uh, the motor cortex light up, that has the uh, olfactory cortex light up, that has even the taste regions light up and the sight regions light up. So all the senses are awakened just by the sound of the story. And this is what happens when you do the, uh, the story as well. What is even more interesting is that when you tell stories to the customers in the form of a video, Instagram story, Facebook story, or even in a blog post or on the website page where you talk about the story of your brand that is concrete, simple, and interesting, then you and the other person's brain synchronize, just like as if you were engaged in an act of telepathy. What does this exactly mean? Well. This was, uh, this was uh, once um, uh, discovered by one of the scientists from Princeton. When one person tells the story and the other person listens to the stories, the two brains that are part of this um, storytelling extravaganza actually synchronize. So here you have the, the, the speech pattern um, uh, networks here, where you actually have the two uh, brains that are starting to react very similarly, both from the speaker and 
from the uh, and from the person listening to uh, to that. So uh, that is yet another reason why you should actually actively use stories because with the stories you can have people resonate with you, and that is a big thing. You know, so they can understand, they can react to you on an emotional level, and they can also remember more. So you know, sometimes people think, okay, well that is very good, but what if we want to you know uh, tell people and brag about the success? in a form of a data. All we want to talk or address a certain issue uh, uh, with, with, with the data. Well, this is very interesting. And of course you can say, okay, the data or the statistics may be quite convincing. So, well, that is the fact. But once again, the statistics, the data, even a very successful data is not enough to convince people. And once again, I have a proof for that that you might want to consider. Okay, so in uh, United States in 1936, we had uh, the biggest, uh, the biggest possible, uh, the biggest possible uh, crisis. It was the the great, uh, the great uh, depression, uh, which uh, led a lot of people uh, into horrible, horrible life situation. And in the uh, United States alone, the unemployment rate uh, rise rose from. 3% to a staggering 33%, which meant that one third of the Americans did not have a job. What was even worse, that was the production numbers that, that dropped by 50%. And one industry that was really affected was farming okay so in the farming you know it was uh, even more uh, a lot of people were unemployed and it was even worse yet why those people were actually mostly migrants without any sort of social support and without any savings whatsoever to well uh, have any life whatsoever so the, the migrants were in a very bad situation and the production number were, were um, down by 50%. Unemployment rates was staggering. There were a lot of people starving from mal malnut malnutrition, starvation. And well, everything was horrible in numbers. But apparently <clears throat> neither the federal, um, uh, the federal authorities nor the state authorities nor the public uh, did much to help. Even though they were shocked by the numbers, but they were not moved by the numbers. Is the equivalent of you trying to move people with the numbers, and uh, to, but but you only you could do is being shocked by the numbers. So the whole situation changed when one thing happened, and that one thing was a photo uh, of Florence Owens Thompson. This is the story that was later on uh, uh, go by the name of the migrant mother. It was taken by Dorothy Lang in 1936. And on this uh, photo, you can see Florence Owens Thompson, who uh, was one of the migrant workers in California, where she would work um, in a, with a sweet uh, uh, pea um, harvest. But apparently that, yeah, the sweet pea uh, went uh, really bad, so uh, she wouldn't have much work on her hands. That would mean for her and for, Cam Cam uh, for her family, family uh, not, a lot of, uh, not a lot of food and nothing to, uh, nothing to live by. So this photo was actually taken after she made a rather dramatic decision uh, in which she weighted the safety and the food, and she decided to sell the tent in which she and her three children would sleep and have the money for food. Okay, so remember, we had statistics, we had data, and then we had a picture with one single story. And this one single story actually moved people as if there was a face to the statistics, okay? The same goes, even if you have some great statistics about how you increase the numbers in your production, how many new um, the furniture models or, or lines have you in introduced. It does not matter unless you put a face to this statistic. Who does this? Who produces? Who designs? <clears throat> Who are the people and their authentic stories behind the data? You know, the data itself does not move. It may shock, it may uh, surprise, it may be interesting even, but it does not move people. So why is that so? Well, we all suffer as humans for something that is uh, called scope insensitivity. What that means is that numbers and stats do not seem to impress 
us. What they do is, of course, they draw attention, but later on, they don't have that human factor of relatability. So once again, you are pretty much allowed to have numbers and statistics on your website. You can be proud of how much you increased uh, in numbers in the past five years, but make sure that you also have like a far front uh, story that proves that is a, that is a, that gives adds the face to the number so that your company is not anonymous. Okay, that whenever I uh, go to the uh, about us. <clears throat> section in uh, in most of the companies, I can see that a totally impersonal stories about our company was um, uh, was established in 1969. It was established um, in the north of Poland and blah, blah, blah. You know, first of all, just quit the passive voice. Passive voice is totally impersonal, okay? You want to be personal. So uh, this person established, he came from, uh, his dream was he was sick and tired of, or she was sick and tired of. Okay, so just remember, follow the cue of what you had here in the Floyd company. We became because we we're tired of. Okay, somebody was tired of disposable furniture. No, it was it was established because of uh, being tired of disposable furniture. No, active voice is so much better because first of all, we can uh, we can we can associate ourselves with active uh, with active voice we can actually understand the hero and the motivation if we read something like this if we have passive voice the company was established then that we have no hero to uh, to keep our fingers crossed for so <clears throat> that is about that is about storytelling and data and that is about you know scope insensitivity <clears throat> remember the data and numbers might be good for the bank report, but for the general public, for the marketing, you need stories, and those stories give face to the statistics. And one more proof for that: okay, there was a, a, an interesting research done uh, by by some professors, uh, by some professors, uh, and um, uh, and those professors decided to check whether you know the the numbers, the scope of the problem would make people donate more. And they have presented three different groups of participants with the problem in which uh, in which um, uh, birds were uh, affected by the environmental disaster of a oil spill, okay? And in one group, they told them that there were 2,000 birds. In another group, they told that there were 20,000 birds. And in another group, they were told that there were 200,000 birds. And then <clears throat> they asked people, how much are they willing to pledge to donate for this, uh, for those birds, uh, for this environmental disaster. Okay, and you might think that if there were, you know, larger numbers, you know, ten times larger, ten times longer, and hundred times larger, that you would expect larger donations across the three different groups. Okay, but that did not happen. Actually, the donations were well, pretty even. Even the one in the middle being being the lowest, despite the fact that it was actually 10, 10 times more birds affected. The reason for that is that what mostly moves us is a story, okay? So that is what Daniel Kahneman says, one of the most famous, uh, uh, famous researchers of the, of the language and psychology environment and, and, uh, and behavioral economy, uh, the economy of our consumers. So the story probably evokes for many readers a mental representation. So once we hear a story about someone who is struggling, then we can actually be moved by the story. Statistics do not that at all. We all we all need a representation. So what we need here is something that Daniel Kahneman says a prototypical incident. It's just like the face that we can put to the statistics, and that increases the willingness to pay more. Right. So there you have it. Stories increase your brand value. They help you communicate so that people can remember. They also give face to the statistics. They help you resonate with another human being on the level of telepathy, almost. So I do think that I do not need to prove that stories work with you best, but also where do stories work best? Well, <clears throat> first of all, the answer is everywhere. But I think that the answer everywhere would be too much of a general answer. So uh, first of all, you might think of the stories increasing the margin on your product. So not only you want to tell stories to make your brand 
uh, be more attractive and hence more valuable in the eyes of the beholder. Uh, but also you want to uh, maybe have product descriptions that also, just like in the experiment of significant objects, <clears throat> explain the problem, uh, the, the product in a storytelling mode. Stories also build loyalty because once we hear the story of the brand that actually uh, uh, that actually embarked on a journey to deal with the challenges, then uh, we are more loyal to that uh, brand and we support the brand. And therefore, stories they also form and unite a tribe. Think of tribes of people whether that be tribes online or offline, they are often united by a myth or by the story. The community of Apple fans is united by the myth of someone who thinks different, who undermines the status quo, and who dares to, uh, to, to risk um, everything to think differently and to simply uh, go their own way. That's a bit of a rebel there. <clears throat> that is a really uh, interesting story to resonate and form a tribe. The story of Nike resonates with people who form a tribe of everyone who feels like, a, um, like an agent uh, um, a sports person who, is, uh, who has agency and who has the power and control over their own life and who only puts shoes on to run to feel that they can achieve. So <clears throat> they form a tribe and this is a very interesting way because um, as most as most marketing researchers predict, that the future of the marketing is marketing to your tribe, to a loyal tribe that is united by your brand story. And then, of course, they help you build authentic brand, authentic brand that resonates with others. And to preview that, I can uh, I can show you one of the best brands uh, in in Poland that is that continues to astonish us with Christmas ads. And this time I'm going to present you a case study uh, from this industry. This is e-commerce. And uh, I want you to look at it as a sort of like a benchmark for all your storytelling, be that in a form of a, <clears throat> of a commercial, just like here, uh, short video on YouTube, short video on Instagram, or short welcoming uh, video on your website. Uh, this is a uh, interesting case of, of storytelling, which, um, which uh, I'd like to watch with you and later on to talk a little bit further about it. English for beginners. I am, you are, he, she, it is. I am you are he she it is robert i am hi can you show me the way to the beach towel breakfast fork knife bread i love you you are perfect i'm gonna fucking kill you fucking kill you. I love you. You are perfect. I thank you. Put me Suitcase. Slippers. Toothbrush. Passport. Pyjamas. Be good dog. Hi, I am. Hi, I am. Das 
passengers on flight Aerolinias Argentina. Hi, I am your grandpa. All right, and that was a story, okay? So it was a three minute story and that actually took internet by storm because everyone was sharing it. Well, everyone, almost everyone was sharing it with their friends. It happened four years ago, and um, I'd like to come back to this um, to explain the nature of the storytelling and the arc of the uh, uh, of the story. So now I'm going to do uh, something to, to show you how the story goes and how, what is the shape of, <clears throat> of this particular story. Well, first of all, in this particular story, we get to know up front the, um, the, the, the hero, okay? So, if it was the setting uh, of um, the, the beginning of the of the story, it includes the <clears throat> the hero. This time, it's this rather older, rather pleasant, um, seemingly uh, uh, se seemingly um, uh, solitary, alone person living somewhere in Poland, and that somewhere in Poland creates uh, the, the space. And, and this person, uh, this person. Well, is uh, approximately in the autumn um, decides decides uh, to embark on a certain journey, and the challenge for him is to apparently learn English. So he wants to learn English. That is his motivation. Okay, and the hero and the motivation they create the most important tension in each and every story. You need to have a hero who has a motivation. Remember Floyd, the furniture company that I talked to you about, they had a motivation to come up with a sustainable, lasting furniture because they were sick and tired of disposable furniture. That's the hero and that's the motivation. Okay, so their motivation, his motivation was to learn English. Okay, so he embarked on this journey in which he, you know, somehow succeeded, but then again, you know, somehow made some mistakes and then on the way he was succeeding and then making making a fool of himself sometimes like in the uh in the uh, in the uh, on the bus and then he finally finally reached his destination where he there was this climax of the story when finally it was revealed why it was so important for him to learn english okay so this whole thing is the hero's journey that starts in a certain place where he wants to do something and then he's transformed into another place where he finally does it when he achieves uh, his his uh, his goals and you know here we have this happily um, ever after okay so <clears throat> this is a ba these are the basic elements of the story and as if it's a, as a, as a hero's journey where you have the settings where you have important hero and it's a person not a company then you have the the place which um, can be approximate place um, whatever is important of course with the companies that was set for example i don't know in Varmia and Mazore or in Estonia and you have this specific region when it was set then of course it's important especially if it's relevant for the story and then you have the time of course once again if the company was established in 1922 or something like that that is really also important to mention that and if the story's time is relevant that is also important but what is most important is that you have to have a motivation and an ambition okay the hero without a motivation is as interesting as watching a paint dry or mushrooms grow nothing much to see so remember the hero motivation time place and the journey okay and the journey do does not have to be all easy peasy it can have you know holes ups and downs uh, especially if you're struggling and then you going further so that is the shape of the story and that was the shape of this little story but you know, th this little story was, of course, you know, high budget production, and you might think, okay, that's a great company, how can I do that? Well, you don't have to have elaborate video settings to tell good story. What you need 
is a good story indeed. So you have to try to, uh, you have to look at your company, at your values um, uh, as, uh, uh, from a storytelling point of view. And when you come up with stories, remember that they have to be simple, <clears throat> unexpected, credible, concrete, emotional, and of course, in a form of the story. That all together forms an acronym of success. Well, I would say almost a success as everyone who knows English knows that there is a S missing uh, in the end, which is, you know, success um, because it's almost guaranteed success, I would say. Because of course you can, uh, you can uh, have all those boxes checked. You know, your story might be simple and expected, credible, concrete, emotional in the form of a story, <clears throat> but still have, a bit of a challenge, but it is still a lot more probable that you will success if you have those boxes checked, um, uh, you know, compared to the situation when you have a totally difficult to understand and process, totally not surprising, not very credible, extremely abstract, devoid of emotion and just facts and not a story. Okay, so what does it mean that a story has to be simple? Well, it has to be chronologically simple, and it also has to be simple in language. After this webinar, you're going to get one of the eBooks that is about plain language and plain communication. And I speak uh, to this on behalf of all your future customers. We will appreciate simple language. Cut the marketing bullshit bingo, cut the pompous words, cut out most of the adjectives, just use simple language. Don't blind us with the, uh, with, the, with the puff of big words. Simple, plain language, which is active voice, short sentences, and concrete words. Then make sure that the story is unexpected so that we do not know about the struggles, about the, uh, the, the, the course of events, okay? Unexpected is interesting. Uh, even if we know that you are already successful, then we want to know what struggles were they on the road to this success. If you're working on a product, don't tell us that this new product just came um, so easily to you. Tell us about the struggles of the R&D team and then how they overcome the struggles, what made it so difficult and why it was worth it. These are the kind of stories that people want to hear. They don't want to hear a flat uh, story that is a flat line per se, because that means that your story is dead. Okay, and then uh, you want to be credible. Where does credible come from? Well, of course, the messenger who, who is telling the story. So, you know, it's good to have at least the, 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 the picture of the author of the story or the picture of the people behind the story. If you're telling the story about how you go about design process in your company, show us the designers, the people. Don't use generic stock photos. Then, of course, credible also comes with the simplicity. Okay, it's a funny thing. The easier it is for us to prepare, uh, process the, the knowledge, the information, the more credible we view the uh, the messenger okay and then concrete <clears throat> concrete means easy for you because actually you operate in a concrete material industry you don't have you know digital transformation you don't have abstract uh, abstract totally um, totally not concrete uh, words from the digital industries you have furniture you have oak you have wood you have colors, you have good, very sensual material. So describe it concrete, make people see the image, have people touch your product with the words, have them understand the story by the use of very concrete words. Okay, what are concrete words? Well, <clears throat> instead of instead of, um, uh, for example, uh, uh, telling, uh, telling a chair, describe this chair more in a more concrete uh, concrete uh, way instead of giving them a broad category of the sofa or the innovative material describe them what the material feels like concrete means activating your uh, your customer's brain with uh, really concrete words and sentences and then emotional okay <clears throat> that means that you want people to be well you want people to be engaged because your story is interesting. Okay, so interest, surprise is one emotion that you want to evoke. The other one, 
you want to touch people, just like the Allegro uh, commercial was probably touching, I hope at least to most of you. And then you want people to be touched. You want people to have to smile. These are the positive emotions you want in your stories because those two emotions, joy and, uh, and elevation being touched also promote virality of your story. And then of course your story has to be a story. <clears throat> so this story uh, um, uh, it has to have a certain standard, um, standard elements, just like I told you, the story has to have a hero who has a strong motivation, who comes from a place and time and then goes on a journey because he has this motivation that pushes him towards the action. Those action form course of events that led toward the climax and then there is the ending. So just like the design process is the story, just like making a company is a story, just like working on a new project to have the transparent logistic process is a story. Everything can be a story and you <clears throat> should definitely tell that story. And sometimes the stories can become viral, okay? So when does uh, the story that becomes uh, viral? When <clears throat> sometimes when there's the relatable hero and when the story uh, is uh, around the hero itself. And I'm going to give you uh, two interesting case studies from other industries that prove that you can make the customer the hero of the story and make him share your company's story uh, alongside. That is very interesting, okay? Once a year, a streaming service, Spotify, uh, gives you a chance to discover what was your individual musical taste towards uh, uh, throughout the year that has passed. Every single user of Spotify who is registered gets an insight. It's a story of the soundtrack to the year 2021 this time was and in this story you get to know what were your top artists your top podcast what sort of music did you listen to and it creates like the story uh, a visual and musical story around you as a customer so what most people do i'm not saying that all people but most people once they get on this visual story that is also in the form of a digital file they instantly share it because it's so easy to share it on instagram or facebook that means that those people are actually acting as banners for Spotify because each time they are sharing the story they actually uh, they actually uh, um, they actually advertise Spotify that is a very clever way to do that why do people do that because <clears throat> they learn that there is a story about them that is um, that is um, encrypted in those song minutes listened their musical taste so they want to share it as a part of their identity Another company that uses this format very interestingly is, uh, is the company called Bolt, okay? Uh, Bolt uh, every year uh, um, produces uh, the, the story uh, of the, the struggles and how the customer, their customer, each and every person who uses Bolt is overcoming the struggles. So they set the point as the setting is the cities that where there are too many cars, there are there are the, the, the traffic jams, there is the pollution, and then there is the hero, their customer, who is helping by using the <clears throat> by using the shared transport model and their electric scooters. So once again, it's a story. It's how you, the customer, contributed. And this also makes people share the story about themselves. Well, I must admit, uh, with a less of a success than Spotify, but still, it is a story that people want to share. Why? Because it is a story of them doing something. So think about it. You might tell, tell people the story about yourself, but also sometimes you might want to have uh, customers telling the stories how they used your actual um, uh, uh, furniture, interior design elements to write the story of themselves. So make sure you want to document those stories. Just like the Leroy Merlin did uh, um, the, the, the campaign, the storytelling campaign about their customers, okay? The hero in the house is this guy who made <clears throat> the tree house for his daughters. The, the hero of the house is this woman who actually turned her balcony, uh, like a typical balcony in a block of flats into a 
blooming, blossoming garden. These are the stories also the customers want to hear. They don't only just want to hear stories about yourself. So the story, what actually makes a story go viral? Well, first of all, the story has to be current. It means that it has to be up to date. It has to be relevant for the time being. Why is the Spotify story, the Bolt story, and the Allegro story relevant for the time of the day? Of the, of the year because these are all Christmas times. And in December, we tend to think of the year we had and plan for the year we're going to have. So what sort of stories might you come up with? I actually, for, for, for this matter, came up with the summaries of what I have achieved with each and every single client of mine, telling them how many people I worked with, how many uh, marketing communication workshops we did together, how we elevated their company and their skill teams uh, together. So these are the stories. I put them in a nice report card. It's a story of what we have achieved this year with each and indiv every uh, individual customer. And I do realize that you might not be able to uh, to, to show each and every individual customer who bought from you or the distributor, but you might think um, in a similar pattern. How can you tell the story of the year that was and what will the story of the next year be? And then, of course, <clears throat> social currency is one thing. The other thing is the triggers. What, uh, what is the story triggered by? Then emotions, okay? Without emotion, there is no virality. The best emotions to boost virality are in fact, unfortunately, the first one is anger, but the second one is joy and elevation, which is where people are touched. Then there is fear. Then there is the disgust. So, out of those, you might want to use uh, you might want to use the joy and hope and uh, and uh, and laughter and fun and you know elevation. That is fine. Then <clears throat> make the story so that the story. Uh, benefits from being public, okay? Why do people want to share the stories about the musical taste, uh, how they contributed to the, to the environment, why they want to share the stories of how they bought one of the uh, most expensive furniture, which is one of the armchairs that I'm really actually hunting uh, for. Why do they want to sell it? Why do people sometimes when they buy, buy things or yesterday, um, uh, yesterday, when there is a story of a brand, especially when there is the, the 1950s and 1960s furniture, because they want to publicly brag about what they bought. The story of each and every piece of furniture of on yesterday is a, um, is a, um, uh, is a, these are the words that help people to brag about their choices, about their taste, about what they believe in. So make sure you also uh, allow that. Then there might be practical personal value. And then, of course, the story will be shared if it is a story, not just fact. So all those elements make stories go viral. But what else? Well, when you are <laughs> selling ideas, and when you want to use stories, uh, you will sell, okay? And I'm using the sell as a metaphorical way here. And, but will your customers buy your ideas uh, that are in the form of the stories? Will they actually buy it? Well, it greatly depends whether uh, the story answers the list of the questions positively. And those questions are as follow. Okay, so is the story I'm listening to or reading interesting to me? Is the story new to me? Have I heard it before or is it just new? New for the human brain is equivalent for interesting and nice to follow. Then is the story useful for me in a form that it's entertaining or is it useful because it gives me some information about the product or does this, is it useful because it boosts my identity? OK, especially if you are working in the furniture business, furniture, just like fashion, just like diet, just like beauty. They are all 
identity boosting products okay there is a time for people's life for the ikea identity then there is a time in people's life for the identity of someone who buys mesmetric or book concept then there is time in some people's life who buy something even more uh, expensive or there is time for someone who only buys vintage furniture because they want to express their their identity with you know, with uh, with the vintage furniture okay so is it useful? Is it helping me in any way to understand something or is it helping me to boost my identity as a person? Do I get the story? I mean, do I understand the story? Let's face it, even though the Allegro commercial was done for the Polish market, and well, I'm pretty much, I can pretty much see that most of you are, are, are Polish, but then there is Ryan, and I suppose that Ryan, you might confirm it, Ryan, in a chat, you also got the story, even though it was a Polish story, but you got it because it was rather universal story, okay? The next thing is, do I get the meaning of it? So do I get why is this story here and do I get this meaning of it? And hence, is it worth my time? Okay, so if the customer, the, you know, the object of your story answers all those questions with a firm no, then of course you are on an unfortunate, I don't like it. I actually am not very interested. I don't trust it. I'm not going to follow that brand. And then, if they answer positively, meaning that they say, yes, I like it, then, well, this is a very good news for you. So I don't buy this message versus I buy this message. And with this message, I buy the products, I buy the brand, I brand, uh, I, uh, I, I am loyal part of this tribe. And all of that can be achieved by implementing three most important layers to each and every story. And those layers are as follow. The first layer of the story is the value of the story. So what is the big idea behind your story? Then, then there is the narrative, which is the structure of the story that is filled with sentences that are composed of precisely hand-picked words. Here, there is no place for being mediocre. You want to have the best possible narrative that comes in the shape of the story that is composed of, that the structure is composed of sentences, simple active sentences that are each composed of words that are carefully selected and chosen. Then once you have the narrative, you might think of the visual boost. Is it going to be the visual boost of the video, just like in Allegro? Is it going to be the visual boost or visual presentation, just like in Spotify or Bolt? Or is it just going to be a nicely formatted blog post with, with, uh, with pictures, just like we had in case of, um, uh, of uh, Artifox? Or is it going to be an Instagram story uh, that, uh, that unfolds uh, with, uh, with both the visuals and the narrative? Okay. And then, of course, how you deliver the story, what is the platform that you deliver to? Those four elements, they form something that people perceive. And if they perceive it correctly, then you are in a good position. So remember, because the value, the narrative, the visual boost, the delivery are crucial and essential layers. You cannot have a good narrative if there is no main thought in your story. There is no point in making extravagant visual bursts if the narrative is kind of crooked and nothing worth it. And of course, well, you can think of having, you know, Instagram, Facebook, website, but if you have nothing to show there, just, you know, everyday reminders that it's Friday, Thursday, Monday, it's not good. So let's think of value first, because actually that's how, it'll be, uh, how you should be uh, um, uh, working. You know, first, the value. When it comes to the value of your story, you should think, what is the purpose of my story? What is it that I want to teach people about, convince people about? What is my big idea and why it should matter to people? So if the value of your story is to tell people that you as a brand are sick and tired of disposable furniture and, uh, and relentless consumerism, then, of course, this is something that you might want to prove. And the value is also about 
What is the purpose? What is the big idea? Why will it matter to my customers? And then you might want to start working on your narrative. Okay, and you already know that the narrative is first and foremost the structure of your story. And um, once again, I'm going to I'm going to uh, draw uh, draw to you the structure of the good story so that you never ever miss it, because that would be a shame. You know, you probably have great stories to tell, but those great stories also deserve a great uh, structure. So the great start structure in your story uh, should always start with a setting okay and as you remember and i'm pretty much sure that you could uh, do it for me you know the hero that lives in a certain place certain circumstance in a certain time and has a motivation to do something because there is a challenge and there is an obstacle or there is something that makes him want to do something and this something is uh, creates the tension which is the tension that drives the motivation okay so then there is motivation okay so once you have the motivation, you have the course of events, you have <clears throat> events in your story, this is the journey, and then you go into the climax, and then you have takeaways from your story. That's the shape of the story, okay? And the shape of the story is a first step of crafting the narrative. The second, uh, the second is, of course, sentences and those sentences that play language with a certain tone of your communication and with the best possible uh, well-selected words okay so the narrative you know should be also simple unexpected concrete credible uh, emotional and in the form of the story and when it comes to that narrative please do remember about the plain language that I've mentioned so much, uh, so, 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 um, so often, you will receive from me a ebook that contains all the best practices in terms of, uh, of, um, uh, of uh, plain language. Why? Because I really do care. And I'm sick and tired of going to the website of companies who think that complicated jargon and pompous marketing bullshit bingo is something that will be magically um, transforming their, uh, their, their visitors to the customers. It will not. At most, it will cause nausea or a coma. So plain language. And also uh, make sure uh, you make sure to have um, uh, to have a um, uh, a very uh, a very uh, a very good uh, very good plain uh, language support uh, by clear uh, clear uh, motivations and have uh, the and have the the real people in the stories. Okay, don't imagine people. Uh, don't create stories. Have stories and edit stories that are out there. Okay have stories about uh, your workers, about your, your owners, about the founders, about the processes, people who are doing these processes. It is all about the people. And it is also all about the shape of the story. Each story is, uh, is trapped between the beginning and the end. Okay, that is the timeline. Okay, each story happens in time. So if you're planning, mapping out your stories for your future marketing communication, uh, you know, the beginning and the end is obvious. But then there is, of course, the other axis, which is the plus and the minus. Okay, the plus and the minus uh, are the elements of the, of the story that are also relevant. Okay, the plus signifies everything that is good. It is the hope. It is the solution. It is the ideas. It is the it is the happy ending. The minus symbolizes everything that might go wrong, the obstacles, the challenges, everything that might go awry. So, what happens here is you uh, you actually uh, have the, the 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 two axes that you should follow. So think about it. You might start with uh, with with your story saying that you know by 2050 we will produce this many um, this many furniture, and that might sound like a great news to all of you. Whereas in fact. Uh, I see here a problem because that means that we will uh, that we will have uh, this much material probably put to waste, and that's why because it makes us sick and tired. We want to make a change, and we did this change, and we want to have this idea to have a more sustainable model, and that's why we have embarked on this journey. And 
On the way, however, we decided we, we discovered that there might be some obstacles. So as you can see, we go from plus to minus, from minus to plus, from plus to minus once again. And this shapes a very good uh, arch of the story. Actually, the story that remind us of the patterns of uh, that caught Vonnegut uh, not only uh, not only uh, discovered but also documented. Kurt Vonnegut is one of the most talented storytellers in the universe. He's the author, a very popular author, and also a researcher. And what he did, he compared the patterns of stories, only to come up with interesting patterns that you might use. Okay, And some of those patterns uh, bear the name of religious stories even, but do not worry, uh, there is no religious feelings hurt here. Okay, so the first pattern of the story is the pattern of the man in a hole. That means that it is a story about the company, for example, who was doing very well, but then the, then the crisis came, but they were brave enough and, uh, and uh, savvy enough and witty enough to overcome the trouble and rise up again. This is a very typical typical story. And very often when you are telling about any sort of challenges that your company experienced or the production process experiences or even the R&D experience, this is the story that you might want to use. The second, uh, the second quite typical story that is similar to the one is the uh, is the uh, boy meets girl uh, type of story of course that does not mean that it has to be a romantic involvement it means that the main character the hero of your story comes across something wonderful gets it and then loses it and only works hard to rediscover it to get it one more time okay so that's a very typical story then of course then there is a creation story which might be the uh, the creation story of your company actually when you go step by step by step by step towards a greater success how you grow and what sort of challenges you had um, on the way then there is the new testament where you have the creation story and then you go down and once again uh, bear with me that does not mean uh, that does not mean that there is a, that there is a, uh, that there is a, a very religious connotation it just means that this pattern is in the old testament but you can also use this pattern in your stories that means that you are telling the story of someone who is growing to uh, to great numbers great statistics great success and then goes down you know then it would be probably like a cautionary story but then you can have a New Testament kind of story, which is, you know, go up, go down, and rise up again. Also similar like the man in the hole and Cinderella. Then there are the other two types of the stories that you probably will not use, which is which way is up and it, from bad to worse. And the reason I'm saying that you will probably not use those, um, those stories is because, uh, well, you probably don't want to have a story about your company or your product that is from bad to worse unless you are as clever as ben and the jerry's which is a brand with a great sense of humor and what they did is actually they have a um, a cemetery of the tastes of their ice cream that went bad you know, meaning that they were not successful and and uh, they dedicate an a niche tombstone tombstone on uh, on their cemetery to each taste and they tell the story of this of this uh, of the taste that was from bad to worse and the other one is which way is up which is more like a hamlet of the sopranos where you actually don't know what is good and what is bad i would say that probably for your purposes the stories of men in a hole and boy meets girl and creation stories would be would be the best so you know think about it what is the shape of your story and uh, and how you can produce it okay so think about the stories that start with the hero uh, in a certain place in a certain time that then um, has some challenges ahead and then has an idea how to overcome challenges and then actually has some more trouble on the way only then to find a secret solution to it to come to a final success just like Ikea did in Israel with this particular story about this particular project. And please do listen to it because it's really, really interesting. Hi, I'm Eldal, 32 years old. Although I have cerebral palsy, I do everything I can to conduct myself like everyone else. But in my own home, of all places, I'm surrounded with furniture crying out cripple. I'd like to sit on a regular sofa without being afraid I won't be able to get up to open regular closet, or even to turn on a regular lamp. One in every 10 people in Israel is a disabled person.
The IKEA design vision gave birth to the This Ables project. Smart hacks making IKEA's best-selling items accessible. The project was created in collaboration with two NGOs, Milbat and Access Israel, and started off in the IKEA store with a hackathon of product engineers and disabled people that enabled better understanding of their needs. In the end of the developing process, 13 new products were born, each solving a different accessibility issue, such as sofa elevating legs for easier ascending, lamp button enlargement, special handles for PAX closets, and more. The new products are presented in the world's first accessible living spaces in the IKEA stores. The new models are available for download from the project's website, disables.com, and 3D printing anywhere in the world. So that Eldar, Dina, Pavel, Inbal, Moshe, Tahel, and Liel can also feel comfortable in their own homes like everybody else. Now they should come up with products that assemble themselves. All right. So this was a story of a struggling hero, a customer with a cerebral palsy who was struggling uh, around his own home where all the furniture was screaming crippled to him. And I dare say it's like a 10% of the population. So if 10% of your potential customers feel uncomfortable with your own furniture because they scream crippled to them, then it's high time to do something about it. And IKEA did something about it. They invited this hero, this, this, this guy, to a designing, uh, to a designing uh, process with R&D uh, um, uh, experts and other uh, people with, uh, with disabilities to come up with the new uh, adjustments and the new, uh, and the new product that were later on using uh, great technology implemented uh, in stores across, across IKEA. So what we have here, here is a typical message. And this typical message in the form of a story is so much better than just facts i mean it is not you know like there's facts and there's stories of course stories should be based around the facts but they should have this arch of the story what this story also delivers is the message that is especially attractive to this belief driven consumers that i've mentioned to you because actually 64 percent of customers right now are not only paying attention to price and functionality of your product but they also pay attention to the values that your company lives by so if for them the values like inclusion like sustainability, like, uh, like a smart consumerism, slow life, minimalism, essentialism are important, then you might want to think how you can tell the stories about what you do to overcome the challenges and live up to those values. Of course, you know, I'm not saying that you have the values like IKEA here, but you might definitely decide what are your values and how you want to tell the story. And next time, when you start any sort of video, webinar, marketing message, newsletter, and you say, I want to tell you a story, remember that in this sentence, we have two incredibly important words. And the first one is the I. Who is I? Who is telling this story? Is it the founder? Is it the person who designed the product? Is it the customer? Is it the customer that co-created the product? Is it, is it the marketing, uh, marketing um, uh, director or marketing specialist who is fascinated by the furniture industry? Who is the I in the story? And then who is the you in the story? Who is this customer of yours? And remember that when you have got those two elements right, when you have the value, narrative, visual boost, and delivery in space. And when you get the inspiration from the movies I watched with you, with, from Ikea, from Allegro, when you get uh, to look at the, at the companies like Artifox or Floyd, you probably will not go wrong. And added to that, you should probably remember that, you know, active voice, never passive. Remember who the I and who is behind it, and the you, and who you refer to your audience. Think of telling the story as a mass tool of intimacy. And next time you, know, you want to tell your story, ask yourself why you want to tell it, how you want to tell it using the tools I told you about, and then what is it about. My name is 
Uh, my name is Piotr, and I'm now very happy to answer your questions if you should have any. So now the time is yours. I'm done with uh, telling you about stories and telling your stories, actually.